guard for all uh, uh, guard for all guard uh, powers Ethiopia empowers Africa and also beyond that guard also sustains uh, the wallet please uh, allow me first to congratulate to all Ethiopians uh, and our African brothers uh, and sisters uh, on the occasion of uh, the completion of the third feeling of uh, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, uh, and also the starting of uh, the second turbine of uh, uh, the GERD. Uh, having said that, I would like to welcome uh, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Henok Tefara uh, and our speakers, uh, Dr. Trusso Asafa, Professor Hagai Ehrlich, uh, and uh, my sister, uh, Hermela Brook, who is going to be an anchor of this uh, webinar tonight. Uh, she she is a moderator and my colleagues at uh, Defend Ethiopia Task Force and member of Defend Ethiopia who are here, who made it happen, uh, this event uh, together. Uh, and also to all the participants here, welcome uh, once again. Uh, and thank you really for your time in advance. Uh, then uh, I, I would like to invite my colleague, Katsawya uh, Yeherad, who is going to uh, give us a brief introduction, uh, and then uh, Hermela Brook will take uh, the floor. Thank you very much. Get out the floor. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mahalit, uh, and uh, uh, welcome. Good evening and good afternoon to everyone. So my name is Katawa Yerad, and I'm uh, from the Defend Ethiopia Task Force in Europe. Uh, first, in the name of the Defend Ethiopia Task Force, allow me to welcome all participants. Thank you for coming at this late time. Uh, allow me to welcome His Excellency Ambassador Henok Tafarra, Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Ethiopia in France. Uh, Dr. Tulso Asafa, a professional uh, on, the, on hydraulic. Uh, Professor Hagai Eric and Mahalit Ayele and Ermel Labruk. To give you a brief uh, introduction of what our task force is about, in essence, it's a network of Ethiopian professionals and scholars here in Europe who are volunteering and who has been engaged in various activities relating to public, public diplomacy and advocacy to protect Ethiopia. The task force is active and organized in 12 European countries and works hand in hand with other sister organizations in. North America, particularly in the US and Canada. The, our group was born in November 2020, just after the conflict erupted in Northern Ethiopia following the attack of the TPLF in the Northern Command, as you all remember. From the day of that attack, a lot of disinformation was being spread on the conflict, both in mainstream and social media. So a number of uh, Ethiopians in London uh, decided to form this group, which has then expanded to 12, 12 European countries. The main objective of the task force is, and still is, uh, to defend Ethiopia from pressures by external entities. And we do this through public diplomacy, uh, using skilled and uh, professionals in the Ethiopian diaspora in Europe. We engage in confronting the disinformation and information launched against our country since uh, the conflict erupted. We challenged many of the policies and actions by European government, the European Union, and many UN entities that may negatively impact on Ethiopia's interest. We also try to win hearts and minds of Ethiopians and friends of Ethiopia, Africans and beyond, foreign citizens and policymakers in favor of the cause of Ethiopia. We do that mainly through digital campaigns. Uh, this consists of uh, email and Twitter campaigns, but we also organize, as you know, this type of webinars, which ha has been prepared uh, by our Pan-African wing. We do have a Pan-African wing, which is led by Mahalet, uh, who made the earlier the, the remarks. The aim of this wing is to try to rebuild a new, a new uh, pan-African vision and relations with the rest of the African diaspora community in Europe and elsewhere. We also try to raise awareness about the challenges and pressures faced by Ethiopia as an African nation. This webinar in particular is focusing on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. That's why we need our 
pan-African wing and awareness. <clears throat> I hope this webinar will contribute in raising awareness on the position of our country, of Ethiopia and Ethiopians regarding the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, that it is a promising regional cooperation project, but also that it will bring some insight to our African brothers and sisters and the world on the benefit that the largest dam in Africa will bring. With this, I, I give the floor to Ermela, who is going to be moderating this uh, webinar uh, for us tonight. Ermela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marlet, for organizing and uh, in getting us all together here today. It's uh, uh, very humbled and, uh, you know, in front of this uh, uh, remarkable panel to be able to facilitate our meeting. Uh, as mentioned before, we have uh, distinguished guests and uh, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Henok Tefarashawo, uh, we thank you you very much for honoring our call and for opening this meeting. It's a great celebration that the third feeling uh, was uh, the phase of the third feeling and the construction was uh, was done. It was a great celebration between uh, the diaspora community all over uh, the, the world and also especially uh, back home. And this, I think, is uh, the, the, the changing point of uh, the Ethiopia asking permission to now give conditions on, uh, on how to proceed with this uh, huge, huge project. Uh, and uh, I'm very eager to uh, listen to the presentations and accommodate all the questions that our listeners and viewers will have uh, as a diaspora and also as a, a descent from Ethiopia. Uh, we each have uh, the responsibility of uh, resounding this new bell of, uh, of uh, dignity, of coming back to our human, uh, uh, human sense and recentering and realizing that the world is not of one culture, is not of one understanding. And uh, Ethiopia is asking as any other nation to, to be sustainable uh, in, in, uh, in agriculture. And this uh, third dam from the power that will be generated it will impact uh, uh, millions of households, the agriculture sector, the industrial sector. And we are very eager to uh, communicate this huge achievement and very excited to hear the presentation. Uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Henok Shao, I think the presentation has been done. Uh, I am very in awe of uh, your achievements uh, and uh, you were, um, you are assigned as uh, ambassadors since 2018. Uh, you're the ambassador of Ethiopia to France, Spain, Portugal, and the Holy uh, See. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for uh, being uh, this key figure also in Europe uh, in pushing back all uh, the narratives that came from the status quo. I leave you the floor for we are about to shake the status quo and announce the, the, the development and uh, the, the, the true image that we are all gathering together to rebuild, renew, and forge. Mr. Uh, Mr. Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hermela. Um, thank you very much as well to uh, defend the Ethiopia chapters uh, here in Europe uh, who are doing a stellar job in upholding the interests of our beloved country. Uh, I'm very honored and humbled to have been uh, asked to do the opening uh, remarks for this uh, webinar. Uh, I see that there are eminent uh, experts on water, uh, geopolitical issues. Uh, Professor Haga Erlich is here. I uh, salute you, sir. Dr. Toruso, uh, and of course, uh, all the other uh, participants and members from uh, uh, defend Ethiopia, I see Ato Elias from uh, uh, France, who's also here with us. Um, it's really a, a very timely issue, uh, and I would say that uh, 
you have both chosen the right timing for organizing this webinar and also the right uh, theme or the right title. Um, as you we all know, um, the third filling of uh, the reservoir was completed uh, on uh, the 11th of August uh, of this year. It marked the inauguration of the circuit of the second turbine with a capacity of uh, 375 megawatt. And now the GERD lower level has reached uh, 600 meters with a total uh, storage of uh, in the three years of uh, about 22 billion cubic meters of water. So we're here first and foremost to celebrate this milestone as Hermela pointed out, to thank all those Ethiopians and the friends of Ethiopia uh, who have uh, made this uh, milestone possible through their resilience, unwavering commitment and support, whether through their uh, uh, wallet or through their ideas or even through their advocacy. So we thank all Ethiopians both here uh, uh, abroad and also in the country. All of us Ethiopians have contributed uh, to this uh, really milestone project, both in the history of Ethiopia and in the history of Africa in some way or another. I will start my maybe remarks by uh, uh, outlining my thinking regarding uh, the GERD because I feel that the title you have chosen is, uh, is apropos for that. The, the title is uh, GERD Powers Ethiopia, GERD Empowers Africa and GERD Sustains the World. GERD Powers Ethiopia. Uh, well, uh, the GERD Powers Ethiopia uh, our country, our beloved country in multiple ways. Uh, of course, economically, politically, but also I would rather say more importantly, spiritually. Uh, for centuries, Ethiopians have seen the Nile flow out of their territory without benefiting from its immense resources. For centuries, uh, Ethiopians have languished in poverty whilst they contribute about 86% of all the waters of the Nile. That historical injustice is now being put to an end by this generation of Ethiopians. Therefore, we should all be very proud and finish the job. When uh, His Excellency Prime Minister Dr. Abiy came to power in 2018, the GER project was in danger, in danger of being derailed. He and his team put it on track and accelerated the construction. And today we have reached about 90% of the completion of this milestone project. When fully completed, the GERD is expected to generate over 5,000 megawatts of electricity necessary to drive our march towards food self-sufficiency, to transform our economy from a rural agriculture-based economy to an industrialized value addition economy and will enable those Ethiopians, about 65 million of them who today do not have access to electricity. 65 million Ethiopians, that's the population roughly of France that today do not have access to electricity. As we know, or as we may know, Ethiopia's GDP some 20 years ago was just $10 billion. Today, it's roughly around 100 billion. If we work hard and with the support of projects such as DERG, we will reach a trillion dollar economy in the next 20 years. This means we'll have an economy about the size of Spain or Italy. And we can do it because we have a young, trainable population of 120 million. We have sufficient and abundant arable land with the right policies and with the infrastructure such as dirt, we will transform our economy from a productive, from a, to a productive and industrialized economy and will extricate our people from poverty. Now, when I say that the dirt empowers our country spiritually, what I mean is that our country, as we all know, is fractured along many multiple identity lines. But what unites us as Ethiopians, I believe is far, far more important than what divides us. The GERD as a national project has brought together all Ethiopians, whatever their ethnicity, 
whatever their religion, whatever their gender, and all Ethiopians have contributed in one way or another to this project, which has united us and shown us that we can do whatever we can, what we can do whatever we want if we set our mind up to it. And beyond the contribution of all Ethiopians, it has shown us that with unity of purpose, with dedication, we can achieve anything. It has also shown us that our social fabric remains strong, that Ethiopia as an identity remains strong, and that whatever our enemies, near or afar, try to do to sow seeds among us, seeds of hate and division, we have the capacity within us to rise above it and to reaffirm that our destinies are bound. Well, that's why I say the, the good is actually a renaissance of Ethiopia, not just in a physical way, but in a spiritual way. So the good has really reaffirmed the, uh, an age-old and time-tested Ethiopian resilience or can-do attitude in the face of multiple challenges. Secondly, the GERD empowers Africa. As we all know, it was built and is being built today with the money and resources uh, and mobilization of Ethiopians, but not only Ethiopians, of Africans uh, uh, throughout the world. It, the GERD stands, therefore, as a vivid proof that if we Africans uh, decide and do what is best for us, that we refuse dictations wherever they may come from, that if we reaffirm that we are the masters of our destiny and we mobilize our populations for the development of our countries, then we can succeed. In many ways, the GERD for me symbolizes the refusal of injustice and unfairness that has always permeated international relations and for which we have been at the receiving end for so many years and centuries. It is, uh, in many ways, the revival of the spirit of Adwa, the spirit where we can do anything and defeat any opposition, however strong, that comes our way if we are united. We may recall that uh, on the 25th of May, 1963, our forefathers, uh, established the Organization of African Unity in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Now, many outside Africa, and some also within Africa, criticized the AU, or now the AU, then the OAU, as not having done much. I beg to differ, and I believe that the facts speak differently. It is the OAU, through its Liberation Committee, based in Tanzania, that coordinated the political, economic, and military support for African liberation movements throughout the continent. And in just 30 years, in 1994, United Africa managed to put apartheid into the dustbins of history and to liberate the continent. Africa United, in 30 years, put an end to a subjugation of the continent, which lasted for more than 300 years. That is what Africa can do with it its United. So the AOU and the AU deserves much credit for Africa standing tall as it is today. But the political liberation of Africa is not enough. It is now up to us and this generation of Ethiopians and Africans to ensure that the economic liberation of Africa is fulfilled. And this will only be achieved if we are united like in previous years and if we reinforce African integration. We are, so, we are set on this path. In 2021, as you may know, the Continent and Free Trade Area Agreement came into place and the Secretariat of this Free Trade Area was established in Accra Ghana. The idea being that we will have the free flow of goods and services throughout the continent and eventually of peoples. This is also a milestone. And the GERD is part of the story of African unification because without infrastructure linking African countries, African integration is not possible. And without African economic integration, there cannot be African development.
It is as simple as that. To fuel Africa's development, we need energy. This energy will come from such mega projects as the GERD. The GERD is part of the African Union Agenda 2063, a program for infrastructure development in Africa, or what uh, is referred to as PIDA. It is a major project aimed at connecting countries through energy in order to fuel their transformation. Therefore, with uh, this in mind, and with a view to ensure a peaceful, proper, uh, prosperous, and integrated Africa, projects such as the GERD are critical. Lastly, the GERD sustains the world. We all know that uh, life on this planet, wherever we are, can only be sustainable if all peoples throughout the world, including in Africa, accede to a life of dignity, a life which is free from want. It is no longer possible for the developed world to live in abundance while developing countries, such as those in Africa, languish in poverty. That is no longer sustainable. And a life of dignity for Africans means industrialization of Africa, powered by clean energy sources. The GERD is such a project. It is the largest hydroelectric dam on the continent, which will provide clean and renewable energy for a sustainable world for Ethiopia and for neighboring countries. Ethiopia, along with the construction of the GERD for the last three years has been engaged in the Green Legacy Campaign and has planted about 25 billion seeds, a concrete example of fighting climate change and ensuring that at least at our level, the Paris Agreement on Climate was objective of avoiding dangerous climate change by limiting global warming to well below 2% or two, 2 degrees centigrade is attained. This is what we are doing as a poor country, as Africans towards this uh, common uh, goal. And we are doing it despite all odds despite opposition. We believe that the GERD is a win-win instrument for cooperation between Nile riparian countries. It will enable fair and equitable utilization by all countries without causing significant harm to any of them. As we all know, the filling of the reservoir of the dam is being undertaken in the high rainy season. And the dam is meant solely for generating electricity without any consumption of water. So there should really be no concern by the lower riparian countries. It should not be a source of concern for them. On the contrary, it can and must be used as a formidable tool for cooperation and integration with Ethiopia generating electricity and selling it both to the Sudan and to Egypt. It can be uh, a tool for regulating the flow of water and to better manage the effects of torrential floods that we are seeing in both Sudan and Egypt during the rainy season with tremendous consequences in terms of destruction of property and the loss of life. In the 21st century, zero sum game is no longer possible. One side could not sustainably prosper at the detriment of the other, especially over a shared transboundary resource. The only viable solution is a win-win cooperation. Ethiopia is ready for it. And the sooner we realize it, we realize it and act accordingly, the sooner we will be in a collective position to ensure the prosperity of all the riparian country populations. Lastly, I want to send out a call to all Ethiopians, all Africans and all friends of Ethiopia. Let's redouble our efforts. To, find out, to support the dam with its completion. Let's redouble our efforts through our advocacy. Let's complete it for a prosperous Ethiopia, 
for a united Africa and for a better world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Indeed, uh, this is a milestone. I mean, we're turning a milestone. We're shaking the status quo. We have heard so many narratives on uh, the Ethiopian, Ethiopian political situation. Uh, we, we have seen the Minister of, uh, of um, uh, the en Engineer Seleshi, who was responsible uh, you know, in the international court to represent Ethiopia, uh, say that it is the first time that a country is taken to the international court for a development project. Ethiopia is only asking what is rightfully uh, rightfully owned. It's the nature's gift of Ethiopia, and we're only asking uh, to use it and uh, and 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 develop uh, our uh, economy and see all this uh, 64 million people have electricity and see the mothers that are carrying wood to uh, to 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 make food. Uh, to have uh, to to have uh, to to burn the, the, the to have energy, they are obliged to burn the, the the wood so that they would have other powers that they can they can use that is sustainable, that is renewable, and uh, so that they our people also have their dignity and be humans and get out of this, uh, level of poverty and uh, lifestyle that is really. Uh, really degrading, morally very, uh, very heavy and, and, um, and not of our age where everybody is coming together and saying no more poverty. Uh, we are, we are a, a global village now. We are inclusive. So, uh, you know, during the past uh, years, it is this um, tapestry that is was really, really uh, under a lot of pressure. We have lost most of our stories that kept our societies from different 85 plus uh, different cultural uh, ethnic groups uh, that we, we had this tapestry of stories that we shared together that was building Ethiopia. And it is this, this tapestry that was under so much intervention under so much narrative that was snatched away and that is those stories that we want to bring back say no this time is for Ethiopians to talk about Ethiopia nobody can come and talk on, on our behalf and it's about also uh, benefiting from the resources that we naturally have in our land and thank you so much uh, for uh, for having uh, for for binding all these details that when Ethiopia has has the GERD, has the DAP, generates power, not only impacts the local economy, but it also empowers Africa for Africa to come together at last and also uh, benefits the the overall global global uh, environment uh, environment aspect you know, to answer those questions about climate change and uh, resource management um, and also clean energy. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, I think uh, the next, excuse me, just because we had a modified planning, sorry. Okay, so now I would like to go back, yes, to uh, uh, to Mahlet, uh, our sister, our Pan-African sister, who gathered uh, all the, the people here today. I'm very humbled, like I said before, to be part uh, of the, you know uh, of uh, this meeting to facilitate the um, the moderation to moderate the meeting. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Uh, okay, she, uh, Mahalit Ayele uh, Bayecha. She's an independent African researcher. 
Uh, she also is a creator and a host, uh, uh, and host of Connect Africa media platform. Um, she writes articles and uh, pertaining to GERD from the Pan-African perspective and uh, contemporary African issues. And I'm very, very honored that she reached out uh, so that I can be a facilitator. And, uh, um, you know, when, um, when we are coming together now, you feel a sense that all those uh, know-hows, all those, uh, uh, all those um, professionals that were that had to go out that had to go out of the country they are now eager to come back and and, and participate in this uh, GERD project and other lots of projects are coming up out in uh, Ethiopia and uh, Mahalit took the the, the 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 baton to announce and uh, joined the historical with the local with the regional and also the international aspect of what the GERD project means and what it is going to unfold uh, for, uh, for the Ethiopian citizens and for the world. And I leave uh, the, the floor for Mahlet. I'm very honored. And uh, please, I leave uh, the, the mic so that you can take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Hermela. That's a great introduction. Uh, and thank you uh, about me, except that I'm not going to present now. I'm going to only introduce uh, our first speaker, Professor Haggai Ehrlich, but I also thank uh, the previous, uh, our um, uh, the opening remark uh, made by Ambassador Henok Tefera as well uh, for giving us a synopsis of the topic. Uh, yeah, so without you further, I will go uh, directly to introduce uh, Professor Haga Erl, who is our first speaker. I have the pleasure uh, and the honor uh, to introduce our first speaker of our webinar tonight, Professor Haga Ehrlich. He is whom I can call proudly a mentor in my interest of studying about Abai, uh, or rather known as Nile, also and its people beyond the conflict, meaning the historical and cultural connection of people of the Nile. Professor Haggai Early is a professor emeritus at Tel Aviv University. Since 1973, uh, for more than three decades, Professor Haggai taught and served as a head of graduate studies in the Middle Eastern History Department at Tel Aviv University. He did his BA in general history and history of the Middle East Tel Aviv, uh, at Tel Aviv University. And he did his MA in history of Islamic people uh, at Hebrew University. And he did his PhD in Ethiopian history uh, at School of Oriental uh, Studies or rather known as SOAS in London. Professor Hage has published 23 books and 61 articles. And usually his books or articles are about the Nile Valley, it, when it's not about the Nile Valley, it's people it's about kings of Ethiopia, or it's about the Ethiopian politics, history, and socio-cultural, or it's about the Horn of Africa, the religion, politics, history, and, and culture of the region. Uh, when it's not that, then it's about Ethiopia's relation with the Middle East and the Horn. In general, his works, most of his works revolves around Ethiopia. Uh, his book, particularly for me, is The Cross and the River, Ethiopia, Egypt, the Nile, and then the Nile history, culture, Mises, and the one which is um, edited uh, uh, or written in his own narrating the nine politics, culture, and identities are, uh, in my belief, I, I think to many of us, gave a foundational knowledge of understanding about the history uh, of Nile. His last published work is, is uh, Haile Selassie, uh, His Rise uh, and Fall, which is in 2018. Aside all the academic stuff, Professor Haggai is an, uh, also an athlete. He was one of the leading national high jumpers in Israel. Finally, please allow me to share a personal experience. While studying my MA in Middle Eastern Studies at Ben Gurion University in Israel, uh, the professor of one of the courses that I, uh, I was taking is called the Iranian Revolution. And my uh, professor was an Israeli professor and he was uh, uh, explaining to us how important it is for a researcher to be connected uh, to uh, and be in a place and people that he or she uh, are, uh, is studying. Now, as you can imagine, and uh, given 
the good relationship relationship between Israel and Iran uh, for a long time. My Israeli professor who studied about Iran for more than half of his age did not have the opportunity uh, of going to Iran. In the discussion followed to that course in class, I shared with him about Professor Haggai Ehrlich and his workers, uh, you know, which are known as by many Ethiopians and especially uh, history students at Addis Ababa University, at least in my time. Uh, so my teacher said to me, uh, or the professor said to me, you know, I envy Haggai Ehrlich, he said, smiling and added, uh, in code, uh, I don't think I will ever had a chance to go to Iran. Uh, at that point, I realized how privileged, uh, you know, those academicians who had uh, and still have the opportunity to connect with the people they studied. So with that note, Professor Haggai, uh, I want to express that I'm happy that you had and have the chance uh, and have, uh, and have unreservedly used your, your privilege to share with us your research works. Professor Haggai, the floor is yours. Thank you, Malet. You hear me? Yes, we hear you. Thank you very much indeed. I, I, I was privileged uh, to be an historian of Ethiopia and ever since 1970, I come and go and visit your wonderful country and, and learn uh, from its history and try to contribute. Uh, I'm also an historian of the Middle East. So I, I want to, to give you a brief analysis of uh, the Nile River between Egypt and Ethiopia. You know, if you go to the Bible, you see that the, the Nile is the river of Egypt. But if you go to the geographical and historical more general books, it's the biggest river of Africa. So I'm going to talk briefly on the Aswan Dam in Egypt and the Renaissance Dam now being completed in Ethiopia. When the British occupied the region, not Ethiopia, but they occupied Egypt and Sudan, they sort of engineering the water system of the Nile Basin. And what they prescribed to themselves is to build a small dam in Egypt to take care of Egypt annual needs and do, to erect the big dam of the Horn of Africa, of the Nile Basin in Ethiopia, in Lake Tana. They said, this is the water tower of the region and there should be erected the, the, the main dam of the old Nile system. Well, they didn't have the chance to do it in Ethiopia and Lake Tana. Emperor Manalik and then Ayla Selassie would not let them enter in, thinking for some reason that once they're in, they will never leave. And what the British did is to build a small dam in Aswan. When I was a a child, I, I, I learned about the, the, the Aswan Dam, which meant the small one. And Egypt at the time, I'm talking about parliamentary and monarchical Egypt up to 1952, was oriented towards Africa. In fact, what the Egyptians envisioned in their national dream was the unity of Egypt and the Sudan. They called it Wahdat Wadi Nil the unity of the Nile Valley, because they wanted to control the sources of the Nile in Africa. But then came the 1952 revolution, which switched the Egyptians from their Egypt-oriented nationalism to an all Arab revolution and unity. And with that, 
the young officer headed by Gamal Abdul Nasser, they took them three weeks to decide that they are going to build the old Nile dam in Egypt itself. And as from uh, 1959, there began the works that were completed in 1971 to build the Aswan High Dam. It was part of the vision that Egypt is part of the Arab world, less so Africa. They, they remain, remain part of Africa, but were oriented on all Arab revolution. And the Aswan Dam was meant to be the hub of this all regional Arab revolution. For the inauguration of the works in Aswan Dam, they invited the president of Syria and the president of Algeria. And they simply ignore the fact, as mentioned by President Enoch, that 86% of the Nile come from, Egypt, from Ethiopia and the rest from, from Africa. The, the Blue Nile is only, only, the White Nile is only 14%. But they simply ignored and they built the wrong them in the wrong place as one them is in one of the hottest places in the world, Lake Nasser, which was created by the dam, loses 15% of the water by evaporation every year. And it went along with the historical concept of them that Egypt has the historical rights on the Nile, it was the first civilization they maintained, and therefore, they depend on the Nile, and the Nile is their birthright. It, it's historical rights. And then they made an agreement with the Sudan, the brother Arab, uh, by which uh, the all waters of the Nile are distributed among them, ignoring Ethiopia. That was the reality. In Egypt itself, by the way, until today, there is a internal discussion. Was it right to erect the dam there in Aswan, losing so much water? Uh, and there were other shortcomings of, of the Aswan dam. By in 1987, it was clear to everyone that it's very problematic because if you have a drought in Ethiopia, you, you risk the drying up of the Nile in Egypt because of the dam, of the Aswan I dam. So I, as a student of Egyptian history and of Ethiopian history, I studied the history behind the Renaissance dam, the, sorry, the, the, the Aswan dam, and the relation with Ethiopia. And I put it, as was said in the, in the book, The Cross of the River, Egypt, Ethiopia, and the Nile. And there I analyzed the historical relations between Imperial Ethiopia and, and Egypt. And there was a, it's a story, it was a story, and it is of, of mutual dependency. Ethiopia was dependent on Egypt to provide the Abuna, the head of the state the head of the church, Egypt had always the fear that one day those Ethiopians over there will interfere with the Nile and destroy them. The story of this myth is still there. And by the way, in Egypt, they return to it time and again. It's still, we have all to understand, Egypt life depends on the Nile. And as from now, they think that their destiny depends on the goodwill of others. So they, they, there is a problem. The Egyptians from their side, when I emphasize from their side, they were 100% right. They built their whole country on the Nile and there come the Ethiopians out of nowhere for them and they build this Renaissance them. I want to tell you that switching side to the Ethiopians over history, as was said by, by Ambassador Henock, 
nothing was done. Emperor Menelik promised the British that he will not interfere with the waters of the Nile without permission from uh, his majesty, the King of Britain. Ayla Silasi would not do, in fact, anything except uh, a good bridge over the Abai, the, the Blue Nile. The one thing that he did was to ask for American experts to make a survey of the Blue Nile. And in 1964, they presented, or the Americans, advisors, they presented a report on where the future Ethiopian dam would be erected. Not in Lake Tana, as the British envisioned, but where it is today not far from the Sudanese border. What I can say that for centuries, the Ethiopians did very little until after 1010 or even before. I had the privilege to meet with uh, Mele Zenawi, who read my book. And by the way, he recommended it to Muslim Mubarak of Egypt to read. I don't know if he did. And he was taking the American survey and studying by night. And then began the operation, the secret operation leading to February 2011 of uh, the inauguration ceremony of the works on uh, 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 the great Ethiopian Renaissance then. Meles himself died a few months later in August 2012, but Ethiopia was mobilized and until today is working successfully to build the, 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 the right them for the all Nile system in the right place. I completely share what Professor Hennock, uh, Ambassador Hennock said before, that in Ethiopia itself, this major enterprise is not only a ray of hope for the economic future, but also for reuniting the country. The way I see it, there is nothing more than this great enterprise of the GERD to, to build on a, an all Ethiopian consensus. And secondly, I agree with the, what you said, that it is a win-win situation. It is really the right, them in the right place. And the production of electricity, cheap one, is hope for the region and hope for Sudan and Egypt as well. Egypt is not going to be harmed by the, the guard only in stages that it will be filled and so on, but their anxieties are there and I think will remain so. I'm in a, in a profession of uh, looking to the past and trying to understand even today's problems in their historical roots. I'm not in the profession of prophesizing. But my fellow sociologists and the hydrologists, they tell me, and they can speak about the future better than me, that in one generation from now, there will be 500 million people in Egypt, Ethiopia, and the Sudan. But the amount of water is not going to increase if not the right dam in the right place, where you have little evaporation, you can produce more water in the water tower of the Ethiopian Heights, 
and electricity, you can take care, care of uh, this huge population expected in the future. The thing is that in Egypt, it takes them time to adjust to the new reality. I look at that also from their point of view. It's a new world for them. For 7,000 years, Egypt had the Nile. She owned the Nile. It's the Nile of Egypt. The old culture and the economy, everything is built on that. One Egyptian told me this is the soul of Egypt. To get accustomed to the fact that their destiny is in the hands of others, it's very difficult for them. I follow it a bit and I see that in Egypt, slowly, slowly, they, 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 it's like undergoing what the psychiatrists say, the process of mourning of a departed person. You have the stage of denial and the stage of argument and the stage of, of rage and then finally acceptance. I'm not sure that the Egyptians are, are already there. They still claim to have historical rights. While well, Ethiopia raised the slogan of equitable share for all riparian countries. These are two principles that guide the international relations over rivers, and there is a conflict between them. But uh, I keep telling my friends in both countries, the, the, thanks to the girl, there will be waters to quarrel about, while the alternative is to suffer from thirst and die from hunger. So I, I'm not going to uh, portray it an overly optimistic picture. And I want to emphasize that for the Egyptians is, is nearly the end of the world. It's not the world that they know that the source of the Nile are in Ethiopia. And the Ethiopians of course are 100% right. It is, the Blue Nile is their river. It runs 800 kilometers, kilometers in Ethiopia. The World Bank, when I was writing the across the river, I had a report from the World Bank in the year 2000, defining the Blue Nile as a prime economic resource of Ethiopia. It was wasted. It was flowing to Egypt, not only stealing waters, but stealing land. You know, in Egypt itself, you have to dig six to eight meters in the valley of the Nile in the Delta to reach soil not imported from Ethiopia, courtesy of the Blue Nile. So we have a problem and the problem will be arguing about waters that will be available also for Egypt, and of course, mainly for the development of Ethiopia, for all the great promise of uh, available waters and electricity. It's a revolution, first revolution in Ethiopia itself in that sense. This resource of the Blue Nile was wasted until now, but now it's a ray of hope as Ambassador Henock said, not only for the economy, but also for the uniting of Ethiopia again. Thank you. Until now, but now. You say it's more. Uh, Thank uh, you. But I'm also for. Can you turn off your mics? Thank you.
Thank you so much, Professor Hagai Elri. Um, as you mentioned, yes, uh, I mean, we most Ethiopians also see and um, hear uh, the anxiety that uh, the GERD down could represent for Egyptians. But uh, I would like to make a, a little uh, a little uh, suggestion here, as it is about uh, approaching each other. What we don't know, we fear. What we fear, we fight. Uh, so we Ethiopians are inviting Egyptians to really come and know who are Ethiopians and what is Abai. Abai, the name for the river, means water, uh, uh, father of water. Ab means father. Abai means water. So literally the first name given for the river is father of waters. Uh, instead of the Nile, uh, the narrative that came with the colonial colonization and uh, came up with the interest driven uh, uh, driven approach and uh, divided this two societies, the uh, nations uh, wide apart. But uh, there is a song I, I really like, and it is sung during the, the Shabbat in uh, Israel. It's called Hine Matovu Manahim Shevet Hakim Kam Yakat. Isn't it beautiful when brethren come together in unity? So Ethiopia is resounding and uh, extending the arm for unity as we are fighting to unite back together. We're also extending the uniting call towards uh, Egyptians too, uh, regardless of what's going on. And thank you so much for your presentation. This anxiety has to be considered and we hear, uh, we hear it loud and clear. We hear it through the pressures. We hear it through our, uh, the Egyptian uh, intervention, uh, political and uh, insurgency intervention also, maybe um, uh, maybe there is a way that it's a spiritual approach, it's a big uh, status quo that has been shaken, we are changing a lot of things and instead of the water evaporating, let's use it together as we are bound to use it equitably from now on. I hope you will find the solution uh, very soon. Uh, the, the next person I would uh, present is a role model, model for Ethiopians. In fact, as I mentioned, there is, the, there is this exode of, uh, of intellectual people. There is this exode of young and bright uh, Ethiopians going out of the country who make it abroad and now that are coming back to participate in, uh, in the Ethiopian Renaissance. As a matter of fact, it's not only the GERD, it's the whole country that is being birthed again to find uh, its new narrative. Uh, it, Dr. Uh, Russo Asafa. Uh, Dr. Russo Asafa, like you mentioned also, Professor Hagai, is I think in my view, someone who is in divine appointment when you are at the right place at the right time with the right people. And I would like to thank your participation in the GERD dam on how to, uh, um, to uh, you know, knowledgeably and professionally uh, communicate what uh, the GERD is all about and the impact that it would bring uh, in, in the world. So Dr. Toroso, uh, you uh, is a registered professional engineer with the state of Florida, and he's also a diplomat of the American Academy of Water Resources Engineers and a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Rousseau has written over 40 peer-reviewed articles in various area of water resource management. He is the recipient of the 2022 Outstanding Practitioner in Water Resources Award by American Academy of Water Resources Engineer. And Rousseau is currently, uh, uh, he chairs the Florida uh, Water and Climate Alliance Group. Uh, we have seen him participate in being this bridge that we, the Ethiopians abroad, are called to be today, be the bridge to, uh, to, to, to connect back Ethiopia with the true narrative, with the right perspective of growth, and, and uh, re this renewal of image that who Ethiopia is. And it is this Ethiopia that we would like our neighboring countries to 
understand who we are. And uh, Mr. Rousseau, uh, is, Dr. Rousseau uh, is also the founding member of We Aspire, a group of volunteers and professionals who, uh, like I said, who would knowledgeably uh, introduce and present uh, Ethiopia and its narrative as it is. Dr. Rousseau, you have the floor. I will give you the mic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. We hear you loud and clear. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is great to be invited. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for that generous uh, introduction, Hermila, as well. Um, I, I'm actually a little bit late. I came. I'm not the founding almost, but later on, I joined this great group uh, with We Aspire. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor for me to share this uh, um, webinar with you know, great historian like uh, Professor Eldik. I think I learned a lot today. Uh, and also His Excellency Ambassador Henok, that he put it nicely, not just what I'm going to talk from climate change perspective, that all around how GERD uh, maybe, you know, it's a great example for other places, not Africa, but in the world as well. He, he touched the, both from mitigation and adaptation perspective. When we talk about climate, we typically say mitigation, that is an effort to reduce the carbon emission. Uh, Adaptation is typically if countries don't agree and how do we adapt what we'll see. Today, I will focus more on, on that one, uh, on the adaptation side as well. A few slides, maybe um, seven or so slides, and I want to make sure this is, this is not a, a typical presentation I, I, I do with this kind of diverse audience, uh, but you hear quite a lot on, about climate change, how it's impacting the entire world today, uh, it's amazing if in the U.S. in the last, let's say, five weeks, we have five events that are supposed to come once in 1,000 year. Uh, so once in 1,000 year event means the chance of getting them in a year is about 0.1%. Uh, we just got five of them in the United States. Uh, in Europe, the same thing, uh, heat waves, uh, some even in France where the ambassador is as well, uh, some river drying in, in China. Uh, and if you go to the East Africa, there's a lot of flood now in, in Sudan as well. So it is clear to me that you can see some of the impact of this climate change. And, and it's amazing if you, if you just Google, you know, some of the, the, uh, the, um, news, uh, you will see quite a bit uh, these days. So it's not unexpected, but uh, things are getting really even dicey. And that's where um, infrastructure like GERD even means a lot going forward. So just to give you a perspective, I will touch a little bit, not too much, but a little bit of the science, what we are talking about, and then come back, circle back to GERD as well. So we talk, how do we, when we typically hear, oh, climate change is impacting us, oh, it's going to make us dry, or it's going to create flood, what exactly means? How, how do we get this information and how exactly impact us and how GERD contribution plays into this big picture of climate change? That's where I'm going to focus today. Um, so a short, uh, very, very uh, elevator speech of about climate models. We use what we call general circulation models. So these are models that typically are run for the entire world, uh, representing the physical process of atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, and the surface. And they are done typically at a much coarser scale. So this is the most advanced, you know, models or tools that we have today. But I will, as I will show later on, and there is implication on what we hear from the news and how this is translated on how politicians play this as well. Uh, they are typically about 200 kilometers. So you can see on the right side, you see a picture going up all the way to the atmosphere. Sometimes you have these 30 layers. Uh, so this is the physics, the climate scientist uh, will solve these physics uh, given what happened in terms of emission of uh, um, uh, greenhouse gas emission, including carbon dioxide. Now, some of the issue with this is that because they are high, high, uh, very uh, coarse and high 
uh, area, they, they low resolution basically, uh, for hydrologists like me or for water resources engineers, trying to figure out, okay, how much water is gonna get in the future, how much it change. Professor Erlich earlier said about the flow, whether it's gonna change in a few years and so on. I have some results as well, uh, but that's how we figure out. Uh, based on these models, we try to figure out uh, what would be the future. Uh, and most of this process, uh, including how cloud and other processes, uh, they happen in a very small scale. So there is this uncertainty when we bring into a local level decision making. Um, that's another uncertainty. So how does climate change actually impact us? Um, so when we say we are getting impact from climate change, it we typically means that the statistics, typically how, for example, temperature, um, it has been in the past and what's going to happen in the future. So the one you see in the top for, could be changing the or shifting the mean. So in this case, you will get more heat heat and uh, less of the uh, extreme uh, cold. Uh, that's what we uh, seems to be right now. Uh, we have more of those. So you have this bell shape. Typically you have, okay, for a few months, I have an average and then few months, very cold and other months, uh, hot. So it shifts the entire uh, distribution of that, how the temperature is. Another could be is it, it changed the variability. So in this case, it's just a stretch this uh, bell curve and we get more extremes of hot or cold and the same thing for uh, rainfall. Um, that's another uh, way that's impacting us specifically within the Nile Basin and everyone uh, everywhere else as well. Or it can change the symmetry as I show here. Now, most of the uh, predictions and, and people when they say this is what's gonna happen in the future, uh, there is some, some uncertainties. Uh, the reason I'm going through this is you may hear one newspaper saying this, one saying that, uh, one research says this. It is important to look at the con consensus of many climate models, how they see the future, uh, because an individual model is not going to give you uh, a good um, view of what would happen 20 years, 30 years in the future. As you can imagine, forecasting next year is, is very difficult, let alone forecasting 20 years, 30 years from now. So the first issue is climate by itself is chaotic, as we say, uh, and that's sensitivity for the beginning. So a small shift results in a huge uh, re uh, um, uh, consequences. That's one. The second is that we don't know exactly how sensitive is the climate. And I will give you an example. Uh, for example, 10 years ago or so, the, the, the prior generation of climate models um, and what we have today, we call them high resolution, are actually very different. Uh, the new generation of models, uh, they are, most scientists say they are more sensitive and we are seeing more warming of the climate or the, our world than we thought before. This is important. Uh, because that if you depend on in stream flows on, or other aspect of the hydrology, even in healthcare, uh, that we are getting now hotter than before. So that's the, the second issue. So we don't know how exactly it is. What we know is changing uh, and it's getting even more sensitive. And the other is our ability itself to model at a local scale, because we want to make a decision with the Nile Basin, but we are solving the entire world problem literally from physics perspective, that's not an easy. The other, the four, number four, I think Ambassador mentioned this too, and you all remember the Paris Agreement, uh, is we don't know exactly how the future emission uh, would look like. We can only say if X happen, what's gonna be the result? If Y is gonna happen, what's gonna be the result? So we really don't know what would be the emission. There is wish list. Uh, we can cut to 1.2, 1.5. You heard from the ambassadors uh, talk as well, but that has a consequence in terms of investment to limit what would be the total emission into the world. Uh, so because of that, we really don't know. We can only say if people agree and follow up what they did, what they say they would in, in the Paris Agreement, that will be the case. So if we look at it, so we'd call the first one is a natural. So it's, it's, it's more, we can't do too much about this. And the second is scientific uncertainty. We are learning more, as I said, the new generation 
models that I will show later on, what it says for Africa, what it says for Nile Basin, uh, we call the uh, CMAP-6, the high resolution. We just uh, got this year in terms of the IPCC report. Um, it's a little bit different from what was the prior generation. So that's a scientific un uncertainty. Then you have this human uncertainty as well as on how the, you know, the, uh, the heads of states of the world and how they decide on tackling limiting on these emissions, which as I said, there's implication for uh, um, investment. Coming back now, I'm zooming in into the Nile Basin. I actually looked at about this three years ago, and I looked at hundreds of climate models, and I say the output, and I say, what, how, 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 what do they say for the entire basin? Uh, collectively, this is more than 100. I don't think you will be able to see on the right side, you see different uh, areas, Lake Victoria, Victoria Lake, uh, Lake Albert and so on. So you can see these are the different uh, uh, big basins within the Nile Basin uh, that you see on the right side. Collectively, all of them are saying the temperature is going to increase. There's no question about that. But when you talk about the rainfall, some of them they say it increased by this much, some of them it increased by that much, intensity uh, increases by this much. Now we have to figure out how to summarize this. And that's exactly what the intergovernmental uh, uh, panel of experts typically is called the IPCC summarized and say what's going to happen within the Nile Basin. And that's what I'm going to show you. Um, you can find this report online, by the way. So some of the high level, and again, there is different. The reason I, I went through some of the uncertainties, some of the challenge is because you may see different result in a smaller scale a different place in Nile Basin. But collectively, what they see is that there will be an intensification of future annual rainfall uh, by about 25% in the Eastern Nile Basin. So basically Ethiopian Highland, and then you have Sudan and, and, and Egypt, basically that's the, that's the region of the Eastern. So the rainfall is uh, from the Highland of Ethiopia. And then you have five to 10% increase in Lake Victoria. So intensific intensification means is that you get more rain in a shorter period of time. So basically, so that means you are prone to a flash flood types. And then up to 15% increase in a wet season. So this is important when you look at the Nile within the Blue Nile, and then a decrease 24% in dry season. It looks like, okay, you have increased 15%, you are decreasing 24%, but this overall actually implies a little bit of, actually more in increase in terms of the flow because we get most of the flows uh, during the wet season. In the Blue Nile, we get it almost in three to four uh, months within, within the, the basin. Um, there is increase in precipitation in wet seasons in Ethiopia as well. Uh, and it indicates a, uh, a significant increase for flash floods uh, without storing it to dam. So building a dam, not just guard, but building other dams will, will help us to mitigate these uh, flash flood uh, issues. A decreased runoff in dry season uh, could result in a shortage for irrigation for Sudan, hello. But this conclusion are before GERD. So that means if you don't have any storage that uh, something like GERD, uh, that typically the, it's expected the, the climate change would impact them uh, because it shifts the variability. It brings more the wet season, which they cannot hold. Uh, it will be a lot of flood. And then dry season, they need it to irrigate. They don't have the water. Uh, annual flow revenue, and they check this, uh, actually increases. Uh, within the Blue Nile, uh, and also Khartoum are projected to increase. So this is consensus. The reason I'm saying is you may find a hundred studies, but what the IPCC basically does is um, that they try to summarize based on these many studies and all these uncertainties in a way that uh, most people would agree. And also they give it some confidence. Uh, I'm one of the writer for the National Climate Assessment here in the United States. And there is a way when we say, okay, I'm confident, uh, credibility. So there is a percentage we associate about the probability of something happening. So this is the consensus from the IPCC basically. So where does GERD fits here? 
Well, uh, you heard earlier, the power generation is big for Ethiopia. And then for us, Eastern Africa as well, um, as Ethiopia grows into it, as you can imagine, we have two of uh, the turbines ready at uh, uh, 375 each. Um, if you see, if you go to talk to the engineers, the, you, you would see that um, even though they may produce high, it depends on demand, the time, and so on. So as Ethiopia grows into this uh, capacity of GERD, uh, there's definitely opportunity to, uh, to export as well because there, we don't have the infrastructure, infrastructure already there. Uh, irrigation, industrial uh, expansion, electricity, obviously, flood protection. Flood protection is huge. Um, probably you remember on what happened in 2020, and I wrote an article here you can find uh, in the We Aspire website that for the Sudan, I literally said that uh, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is a matter of life or days. Uh, what, 2020 was exception in a way that uh, we got almost a once in 100 uh, year event and uh, made a lot of distraction. Uh, so that's huge. So that probably will not happen going forward. Uh, that kind of devastation. It increased the storage uh, by about 50% to Egypt and 500% for Sudan. And it is an, an, an insurance basically for uh, going forward into what climate change brings from the, um, uh, in terms of variability. There is some studies, uh, this is from actually by Egyptian and, and Sudanese folks, um, where we are today, we, this is where we are, the total storage in the Eastern uh, Basin and uh, we need this much based on if history repeat in the future. We know history, history is not gonna repeat in the future and we probably need much more storage. So while GERD is great, uh, we still need more storage than GERD uh, to actually uh, weather this uh, amazing variability in terms of the rainfall and, and change in temperature that we, we see within the Eastern Nile Basin. Uh, the other things, I, I took this uh, slide from, I like this, uh, uh, Dr. Khalid, this is one of our uh, partners in, in through the what's called the Friends. If you haven't uh, attended that, that's one of uh, 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 professionals we meet almost every month and for the last, we met for the last 24 or so months. Uh, and one of their studies shows uh, in terms of the benefit of the GERD and they look at um, you know, intensification of agriculture, electricity, all these, you know, what would be the benefit uh, for Sudan? And what they found is, uh, is amazing, uh, about one to two billion dollar of GDP growth for the next 40, 50 years. And uh, one of my favorites is actually, how, how does it impact for rural household? Uh, that's the number you see, uh, 21 to 37 billion. So the GERD benefit, not only, and this is directly, um, uh, countering the climate change, by the way, because they wouldn't be able to do this if the GERD was not be there and given the projection that I just show you from IPCC. Um, in terms of the conclusion, I will just say climate change impacts are not going to, are going to be worse. And we know that uh, because the, the level of emission has not been decreasing at all. So many countries, they, they did pledge to decrease their emission. And again, that that's really uh, gets into investment. Uh, as far as I can see, as far as many people they see, there isn't really a big reduction on, 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 on those emissions. I guess it's better to prepare for the worst case scenario, which is business as usual, unless there is a huge, there must be huge investment. One of the thing I want to mention is Africa's contribution on this emission is minute, but the impact you look at in Africa is significant. So who's going to bear this cost? That's another, another issue people need to figure out. In, uh, infrastructure investment like GERD uh, addresses both mitigation and adaptation. So when I say mitigation, it's basically a clean energy, a much less uh, greenhouse gas emission, which is the catalyst for changing our climate. Um, the reason for this is very simple. The physics tell us when things warm up, uh, they tend to hold a lot of moisture than otherwise. So that lot of moisture has to somewhere go down as a rain. So that means you have more rain coming in down. So it simply shifts by, you know, by, by physics, it's not gonna, energy doesn't disappear. So it's just moving around places to place. Uh, 
so it dries up someplace, takes a lot of water. Um, because it's warmed up, it can carry a lot of rain. And then when it condensates, you have floods. United States is a perfect example this summer. I mean, we have been dry here in Florida uh, this summer like we ha I have never seen. Uh, the July, August, typically we, we <laughs> We shouldn't use our reservoir. We are using that. And then you have flood in many places that I mentioned, for example, five uh, floods in five weeks that are once in 100 years, uh, 1,000 years. Um, other mitigation strategy are important as well, not just GERD, uh, but such as you know the green legacy is important one. Uh, I think Ethiopia, this one thing commandable uh, they are doing is uh, it means that it changed um, the climate, local climate. But it's not enough. If you are doing it only on a small scale, that's not gonna, and not gonna make a big difference from the world perspective. It make a difference for Ethiopia as well in other areas, including, uh, you know, for silt reduction as well as uh, increasing the re local rainfall. Uh, there is studies here. I can give you an example here. I live in, in in Florida, Tampa. We have more than 100 years of record in rainfall, and that the airport there is a a gauge where we measure the rainfall in the airport because of all the asphalt and concrete local heat island, it has statistically significant lower rainfall than any the other station that we have within a few miles. We have many of them, uh, each of them they have more than 100 years of record. So it's clear uh, for us and there are many studies that shows that uh, you know putting a green space increased rainfall. I think that's all I have and uh, happy to take any question. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tereso. Uh, we really uh, now have a uh, uh, scope uh, wider on how we address the uh, Sorry, I was talking with uh, my mic off. Sorry for that. I was saying thank you very much, Dr. Russo, for your presentation, because we had a broader scope on how we can also understand the impact of the GERD on the international uh, realm and how also we can address it um, through the climate uh, mitigation or uh, addressing the climate impact uh, around the world, how the uh, how the um, uh, how the green er energy also could bring a positive impact on this uh, climate uh, warming uh, and uh, you know we have uh, i was encouraging also on the the the, the chat for uh, participants please drop your questions if any uh, as you heard all speakers uh, who presented the historical aspect from professor uh, elrish uh, to also course, the synopsis from the ambassador who made the opening speech. We have uh, lots of scopes that we can address, uh, like the title says, from the Ethiopian perspective, from the African perspective, and to the broader uh, worldwide perspective. Please uh, send me your questions. I will, uh, in on your behalf, uh, present your questions here. Uh, yeah, we have, um, I had a little issues, in fact, on how uh, personally on how we could also as, uh, as a, a nation uh, when we say you know it might sound a little too uh, maybe too uh, optimistic Professor Elrich but uh, when we say we we can answer the questions of the climate on the global aspect we mean business we mean uh, bringing electricity to this millions of uh, Ethiopians and we mean also partnership with our neighboring countries, uh, like also uh, we heard in the presentation of uh, the ambassador uh, that there are um, the electricity that the electricity also from that will be produced from the GERD will be exported in the regional countries and abroad. 
But while the production is, is continuing to grow, uh, we are also addressing more and more clean energy, more and more renewable energy on the, on the international realm. And it will bring, bring the impact that it will bring, but giving the, you know, the, to keep the perspective, uh, we have to keep the perspective on the global uh, sphere, for sure. Uh, I had also that understanding, thanks to your uh, presentation. Uh, so I'm going to, I think, you know, people could be uh, timid, shy from cameras, which I am. <laughs> but don't be shy on the chat. Please drop me your question, uh, uh, like I said. Uh, OK, here. Thank you, Ismail. I have a question. Ismail said, uh, thank, uh, thanks very much for this wonderful space. Uh, for our current speaker, could he elaborate in simple words how the benefits materialize for the people in rural area in Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt? Thank you, he said. Dr. Deloso, you have a question. I can okay. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, the rural is a good question. Um, so this is one of the things I want to make sure that uh, people understand as well, uh, that um, GERD produces quite a, a lot of power. And in fact, it doubles what we have. Uh, I believe if we add up everything, we may have about 400, 4,500, 4,300 megawatts. Uh, uh, but this guard would produce uh, 5,000. So it, it automatically it, it uh, doubles. Now, the, it's expected to boost already started for where you, the connection are. So it gets into the central grid and it's already there. Um, how do you reach to uh, a small communities? Um, you have to figure out what's the best way to do it. And I, I want to be very careful here that because there's a lot of expectation um, that GERD, I think it's my opinion too, that GERD power actually gets into all the small town, all houses in the whole Ethiopia. Uh, we can try, but that's not a wise way of to use the energy. The reason is that energy production, as you uh, bring it from a high uh, situation to to low, small, you will be losing quite a bit of energy. So in that sense, you will cover quite a bit of places, but others will be that you may combine the GERD uh, production, probably through cell, that makes a lot of sense, and then investing that into uh, other alternative energy. So for example, it could be a local uh, wind or solar. So if we are thinking on how to get to a small towns, uh, it, it doesn't have to be necessarily that there is a line coming from GERD all the way to that town, is that what I'm trying to say? So it may be better to use for big industries, big cities, this energy, and then the other potentially sell it and then invest some of the money to, uh, to address the power need of the small town. This is my opinion. So, but I just want to make sure that I personally don't expect that you know, it will get into all the small town in all corners of Ethiopia. Thank you. I have um, I have two questions, if I may. Uh, well, uh, Hilo, I see you raising your hand. I asked you to drop your question also in the chat. Uh, please, if you don't mind, I will address the question on your behalf if you drop it in the, in the chat. I had two questions. In fact, uh, the first one would be: There was a time. Uh, I don't. I, maybe it's not your domain of research, Professor Elrich. Uh, I have a question regarding the, um, the northern and the southern, no, the northern and the eastern part of the, of the Nile. When it came together, there was. It is written that there is. A, there was a big piece. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you read on that uh, period where uh, uh, an Ethiopian or uh, a Kush pharaoh was ruling over Egypt and both uh, the northern and the eastern part uh, came together and, um, and used the Nile water 
equitably. Right? That's why peace came. And since then, there is a, a big imbalance. That's how I understand it. I was wondering if you read about that uh, period of, uh, of the history of the region. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Professor Elrich is not here. Uh, Bahailo, I'll give you the floor. Maybe you didn't understand. I'll give you the mic. Uh, we encourage people to drop their questions. Uh, oh, I have another question here. So I'll, I'll go to the next question. Mine will be on hold. <laughs> Thank you. So the next question comes from uh, Carmela. The GERD is financed with internal resources of the Ethiopian people without external aid. Can this experience be taken as an example by other African countries for the construction of infrastructures? That's the question. I think Dr. Oso can answer the better. Thank you. So the GERD, can, can you, the last one, the, uh, in terms of infrastructure, this, the discussion with the negotiation. I, I'm not sure I understood the. Well, um, okay. Let me let me uh, read it back again. In in fact, it's about how the Ethiopians and the Ethiopian government got together to finance uh, the GERD, and if this experience could be repeated for other infrastructure uh, uh, for, for other infrastructure projects in uh, in African nations. I think yes. That's uh, in fact I I saw some study and uh, I did share something similar like that. Um, so the the question is that whether let's put it this way, a crowdsourcing for funding would work. Something like uh, for you know what we have done in in Ethiopia. Uh, the answer is yes. People they think it would work, and uh, the reason for that is that people will have invested interest on what's happening. Uh, and then obviously they will, you know, they they will follow up and they they will be advocate for all the things that to bring. And then also it may bypass some of the issue of uh, international uh, funding. Uh, that's, you know, big picture geopolitics and so on is not my area, but at least from funding perspective, what I read is that it's a good model to have crowdsourcing. Uh, obviously, it's not an easy, an easy uh, job uh, because you need a lot of money. Uh, you know, we're talking about billions of dollars. How, how are you going to get there? Um, that's an issue. But if it's possible to do it, I think um, that that would work. And many economists, they say that that, that could work as well. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. So I will go back to uh, uh, Ismail Fouad. Uh, he, he, he had also a second question. And the second question, I think, would be for Professor Elry. I don't know if you heard my first question. Uh, I will come back to it later. But this uh, question is for you. Uh, so uh, Ismail says, uh, are there any substantive reasons to believe that eventually Israel may also benefit one way or another from the Nile water, or is this just conspiracy? Can you hear me? It's absolutely a conspiracy theory. Israel, by the way, uh, is now a leading country in desalination and export water to Jordan and other places. And the whole idea, it was an Egyptian idea that, ah, no, it came that Sadat promised to Begin that uh, he, he, Israel will enjoy the waters of the Nile was just a fiction, nothing, uh, not, nothing really relevant. But what was your question, Ermela? Uh, I didn't hear it. So um, my 
question was uh, regarding, uh, you know, it might not be your, uh, your domain, but uh, I know in history, uh, there was a pharaoh who ruled, uh, a pharaoh from the, from the southern part of uh, the Nile. We say he was Ethiopian. He ruled uh, over the northern and the eastern part of the Nile. Uh, so I believe the water of the Nile was equitably, equitably used and peace reigned at that time uh, for, uh, from this both sides of the, of the Nile. Because we know through the Pharaoh uh, history, the northern and the eastern, southeastern part were also conflictual. And, you know, we're living that kind of pressure now. And I was wondering if you had read about it, if, if you could share some, some wisdom on how he, uh, he used, I mean, at that time, the people used the water and if it was also used equitably. Uh, and yeah, I was asked if you knew about that period of uh, this, uh, this history, the region. Well, I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not really an expert on the ancient periods. Uh, I know that uh, the pharaohs in their time, they knew that there is a land of Kush that, uh, beyond, beyond the horizon. And somehow they understood that the floods or, or drought is connected to uh, this mysterious land of, uh, of, uh, of Abyssinia, but I, I never heard anything concrete beyond, beyond this uh, kind of a myth. By my studies, the first time that the Egyptians realized that uh, they depend on the uh, waters in the Ethiopian highlands, it's 11th century or so. And indeed, they sent the patriarch, the Coptic patriarch, to Ethiopia to make sure that the Ethiopians that were part of the Coptic Church uh, that they 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 would not damage Ethiopia. And uh, that's the beginning of the story that I I know, tracing back to the 11th century, uh, but not in ancient time, as far as I know. Thank. You. Thank you. I will, uh, I will put on hold and really encourage everybody to address your questions. Uh, I will go back to Mahlet because she will uh, make her uh, closing and uh, final presentation for us. Uh, Mahlet, please, I invite you uh, while we encourage the questions in the chat, uh, in the chat uh, to take the floor. Thank you, Mahlet. Okay, thank you, uh, Hermela, uh, and thank you for all the speakers uh, that spoke before me. I learned it a lot, uh, and how hard it is to speak after two good speakers, I mean, the best speakers on the subject, uh, or presenters, researchers. Yeah, but uh, regardlessly, we... Uh, I'm going to go uh, and ahead and do my presentation quickly. So the topic or the theme is GERD for all, uh, as you know, and GERD powers Ethiopia, empowers Africa and sustains the wallet. My uh, presentation is specifically uh, GERD is a Pan-African project. And why do I say that? Uh, why? Okay. Uh, in order to answer that, I will ask this main question, meaning how GERD is a Pan-African project, and while answering that, there are some questions to be answered. How Ethiopia and Pan-Africanism are connected, how is GERD aligned with the AU Pan-African principles and values, and how does GERD impact the region or slash riparian states, and what are the benefits uh, to uh, Africa? Uh, so, uh, just to say a little on the, to give a background, Ethiopia and Pan-Africanism, as you know, uh, for most of Ethiopians and even I think uh, Africans globally, uh, Black Africans, I'm talking about Pan-Africanism, 
and Africanism is born out of Ethiopianism. Uh, and there, there's the Ethiopian commitment also to liberate uh, uh, African people. Uh, that's also something we cannot overlook. Uh, and then Ethiopia being seen as a beacon of hope uh, of black peoples across the globe. Uh, and then it's one of the last uh, uh, emperor, Emperor Haile Selassie, in the, uh, one of the founders of the Zen Organization of African Unity, or now known as, uh, as African Union. Uh, I mean, uh, talking about Pan-Africanism as an Ethiopian, uh, it's uh, really impossible for me not to say a little about Emperor Haile Selassie because he is a modern day uh, architect uh, of Ethiopian foreign policy towards uh, uh, Pan-Africanism. Uh, if you see also Ethiopian foreign policy, it's uh, tuned uh, based on uh, Africa and particularly its neighboring countries or the region. Uh, and also it has a, uh, one of the priorities given in foreign policy is strong and economic ties with, uh, with Africa. Yes, we might say that there is no so much uh, intra-trade uh, within the continent, but regardlessly, the country gives that priority. Uh, and I think this is also well demonstrated how uh, you know the power uh, of GERD is going to be transacted or is going to be uh, is going to power. I mean, literally, uh, not only in Ethiopia but also to neighboring countries. Uh, and then uh, Ethiopia has been uh, you know this consistent supporter of the objectives, uh, uh, prince and principles and values of uh, the African Union, mainly when which has direct relation to, uh, to the subjects that we are talking about is of course, uh, African solution to African problems. And why I have these leaders, if you see from Emperor Haile Selassie, uh, you go to Mengistu Haile Mariam, there's uh, Haile Mariam the Salim, Meles Zainawi, and we have now Dr. Abi Ahmed. These people are whatsoever have, uh, are different in terms of their political ideology, but they have been consistent when it comes to Pan-Africanism. And, uh, and that is also demonstrated by the way to, to, to the project, this national project of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, regardless of the difference that they have uh, stick to it. Uh, now, uh, let's go to, you know, one of the, the, uh, the Pan-African uh, values and principles in this contemporary uh, of the African Union is uh, Agenda 2063. Agenda 2063 is known as the, the, the master or uh, the, uh, the master of the master uh, that's going to uh, or the blueprint that's going to transform the continent into a, a global uh, powerhouse. So this Agenda 2063 is actually adopted while uh, the organization was celebrating its 50 years, uh, years uh, uh, anniversary in 2013, uh, uh, a little more than a decade uh, has gone by now, I think, or just a decade. Um, so this seven aspiration, there are seven aspiration in it. Uh, one is, uh, uh, allow me to to read them, a prosperous Africa based on inclusive uh, growth and sustainable development, an integrated and politically united continent uh, rooted in the ideas of uh, Pan-Africanism and African Renaissance, uh, good governance, uh, a peaceful and secure Africa, an Africa with a strong cultural identity and common heritage, an African focused on people-driven uh, people development, uh, especially women and youth uh, and uh, children, um, and then also a strong, united, and uh, resilient, influential uh, uh, global partner. So in this, you can see that GERD already uh, relates that it's a people-driven project, uh, meaning that you know from the straight vendor to the investor uh, in Ethiopia, people have contributed for the uh, to build or to construct uh, this dam. Also being prosperous means of course for the development, uh, you need uh, power uh, to have that integrated and politically united continent. You need to be strong in, in, in the member states have to be strong uh, in the economy. So that also the GERD uh, contributes uh, towards that. Now, you know, those seven aspirations seems uh, very uh, ambitious, as you can say, because it's Agenda 2063, meaning in, tw in 2013, these are adopted 
for the continent to achieve them slowly uh, in, in the next 50 years, meaning uh, in 2063. So uh, in order to do that, what the, the African Union did is that they, they, they came up with flagship projects, uh, a flagship project, I think there are 10 or 12, uh, that uh, member states in the continent should achieve uh, should adopt it, uh, and then you know, according to their priority in their own country, uh, can start to implement it. And then this flagship, pro according to this flagship project, they are going to assess themselves, the member states, whether they achieve it or, or not uh, after each decade. So it's a 10-year plan. Uh, then slowly, eventually, actually, this will help the member states to achieve those seven aspirations or goals uh, called the seven aspiration of the agenda 2063. If you allow me to, to read, uh, these are uh, the integrated high-speed train not network, uh, African commodity strategies, the continental, the African continental free trade area, uh, the Pan-African e-network, African passport and free movement of people, uh, silencing the guns, uh, the Grand Inga Dam, annual African forum, single air transport network, African outer space strategy, and maybe there are some uh, I missed. Uh, but now, how does GERD relate uh, uh, with this? That is the question. Um, if you, uh, uh, as, uh, as, you uh, as you heard, I mentioned the integrated high speed uh, train work, uh, train network in the continent. I mean, obviously, this cannot be implemented without having a power in each member states. And uh, the African continental free trade area is actually one of the protocols which is adopted by the African leaders very fast in less than a year uh, uh, ever since its conception. In less than a year, uh, more than half of the member states, meaning out of the 55 countries, more than half have ratified it. So there is this uh, great zeal and interest uh, to, to implement it. So what GERD does is it will boost that uh, intra uh, trade in the continent. You know, when the transaction happen uh, between countries, for example, there's a line up of countries already to buy power from Ethiopia. Um, there is Djibouti, uh, there is Sudan, although the, their own end of relationship with Ethiopia, we don't know what's going to happen, but uh, also there is Kenya. So Kenya, in fact, recently has uh, their national you know, power the electricity uh, company of the of the country, uh, which is a national one, has uh, signed a contract with Ethiopia to get uh, power. Since, I think starting from 2023, and that will make actually Ethiopia the second provider, the second largest provider of power in Kenya, uh, and then. Uh, the other flagship project of the African Union is uh, of Agenda 2063, is African passport and free movement of people. One may ask why this, I mean, what it has to do with GERD or with water. But the thing is, the, Afri the free movement of people is intertwined with African continental free trade area, meaning without a free uh, movement of people, uh, there cannot be any business. It's true that this protocol of free movement of people, especially you know who are considered la bigger in the continent, did not they do not want to sign it. It's actually one of the slowest protocol in in the African Union that's not adopted or ratified by member states. But the thing is, since this. Uh, is intertwined with uh, African continental free trade area, the interest, that great interest we saw from the leaders to sign and ratify the African continental free trade area will uh, automatically uh, enforce also for them to ratify the free movement of people in the continent. Uh, and also, which I did not mention here, is also the uh, free space, meaning it talks about the, the space uh, uh, with regards to flight. So which Ethiopian Airlines is actually the first to adopt it. So most of the time, we think that when trade happens, either it's a road transport or, uh, or a shipment, but also there is air. So it will also enforce that to have that free space uh, offline between in the continent. And now what the, the GERD, uh, the benefit of GERD uh, for the riparian states 
states and the region. Of course, this has been said many times, but I'll just go through it. Uh, there's literally bringing light to Nile, um, bringing light to those to the right the Nile riparian states, uh, which I said also boosts intra-African trade and it creates jobs of uh, of the youth. I mean, uh, the Eastern Africa is known to be actually the the, the the region where the highest immigration of South North is happening. So uh, some re researchers, as per my reading, are talking about based on data that it might reverse uh, the uh, it might reverse uh, that movement from south to north to north to south. Although we know that actually the 80% of immigration is happening within the continent, not really outside the continent. Uh, so uh, again, uh, talking about the benefits, uh, it, uh, I, I mean, uh, Dr. Trousseau uh, have said it, I think uh, also it's touched by others. It removes silt uh, sedimentation. It also contributes significantly to mitigation of drought. Uh, uh, there's a separate of clean and renewable energy, which has to do with uh, sustainability. And 80% of the Sub-Saharan African people are living uh, actually in this region. So it will ultimately, because you know this aspiration the, of the African Union of Agenda 2063 is very much in line with the, with the, world, with the world sustainable development goals. So it will ultimately also improve the livelihood good of these people. Now, uh, I just put this, I, I just throw this because as a sharpening of African solution to African problems. So once Kwame Nkuma said, it's clear that we must find an African solution to our problems and that this can only be found in African unity. Divided we are weak, united Africa could become one of the greatest forces for good in the world. I mean, from time to time, it's good to throw this and remind uh, ourselves. Now, what does uh, the Great Ethiopia Renaissance Dam means to this biggest Pan-African organization of the continent, namely the African Union, would mean one, uh, it, 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 will, it will bring AU to the forefront uh, of, in the face of the international, uh, uh, the international community. As we have seen, you know, for the past decade, the three, the tripartite countries, namely Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan, have been here and then, I mean, originally the, the, the agreement was to, to solve it between themselves, then uh, it went to the African Union, and then it went to the US, and then it went to the UN. I mean, name it, it's this agenda is taken to everywhere, except that, I mean, it, it was in Africa, but I mean, it's, I think I can say boldly, uh, if I'm wrong, you can correct me, uh, but I can say that it's, uh, it's Ethiopia who have really uh, argued that this matter, if there's any fourth party has to be involved, it should be the African Union. So uh, it now this brings the African Union, in, 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 you know, in the face of the international community, that the African Union is able to take its own matter into its hand and can solve its own um, its own problems. Mostly, we know that the AU is like kind of a bystander by the corner whenever pro problems happen in the in the continent. It's you know, either it's the previous colonial powers or, you know, someone from the international community that come and jump into it. Now this will give AU that it can do, it can solve its own problems. Uh, and then also it will hand, you know, there's, I mean, not only in, in Africa, but also in the world, uh, there's no so much water conflict that we are seeing. So it will give that experience for the African Union, even to the world that kind of, I mean, it took us long, but I'm sure slowly, but surely we will get there. So it give that guideline of managing water conflicts, Ethiopia by being, and, and also the we can say the, tribe, the other two, the downstream countries, Sudan and Egypt, you know, Ethiopia, but by really being a pioneer uh, and it's a sacrificial, I could call it, uh, paving that way. So for any member state or riparian state for, who have a similar problem or who will have a similar problem, I mean, it's, it's, on, it's Ethiopia today, but it could be any riparian state tomorrow who wants to build a hydroelectric uh, power generating dam uh, on the river. So it, it, it will have hand over that guideline. Um, uh, I feel like I'm stuck. Okay, so uh, another thing is a uh, lesson for Africa and its leaders. Uh, number one, uh, 
you know, it is the self-funding of homegrown projects like the Great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. I mean, how many really uh, big projects or national projects that we know uh, are self-funded by member states. Mostly we get a loan uh, uh, from IMF or, a, or even countries when they donate, they don't just donate. I mean, there's something that's a cup, there's a luggage that's coming uh, with it. So it will give that confidence to member states that we can fund, we can finance our own project. So we don't have to be liable for any funder or any previous colonial power for that matter, whatever. Uh, what may be required, you know, behind the curtain, of course, we wouldn't hear that. Uh, so the second benefit that I would see is intergenerational projects are possible. See Ethiopia, I mean, from let's, I mean, let's, for, okay, let, let's forget what uh, before Emperor Haile Selassie, let's start from Emperor Haile Selassie to now Dr. Abiy. I say that they have completely different political ideologies, but they made it, they have stick to this national project. I mean, we have all the possible conflicts in the country, all the challenges, all the pressure from outside and inside. And But we have demonstrated as an Ethiopian that intergenerational projects are possible. Uh, another lesson is uh, uh, that I would put uh, forward is that changing the narrative of transboundary resources uh, like um, Abai or uh, Nile, uh, you know, uh, mostly these kind of resources are taken as a source of contentious, uh, not really as a matter of cooperation. Uh, yes, it took us a long time, but we are demonstrating that it is possible to cooperate uh, on transboundary uh, resources. Um, for me, GERD is really a symbol uh, of Pan-African project because it does for once and for all, it will dismantle that colonial treaties, uh, uh, colonial treaties that where, where Egypt really wants to stick to and don't want to change to. Uh, and then it also breaks the cycle of economic uh, dependence. So that is really, uh, for me, uh, the big thing uh, what GERD does uh, for us, for Africa. Um, my observation, uh, as, as I conclude this, I want to share is that, you know, uh, I think uh, Professor Haga, you shared this maybe somewhere in your book, but also contemporarily, I have seen this, uh, when people of Abba, you know, come all together, uh, whoever shares the water, uh, nature rejoice and demonstrates its support mysteriously. I can I, I can give you an example. I think it's during the first feeling uh, of the GERD. If I am uh, mis if I'm wrong, then, then correct me. But the rainfall on the highlands of Ethiopia and both also, which contributes the Lake uh, Victoria Fall, which contributes the fifteen percent. The, I mean, historically, after 20, uh, I think for Lake Victoria is after 30 years and for Ethiopia is after 20 years, it has been the highest rainfall when we were accused of we are going to deprive the downstream country or namely Egypt uh, of water, but look at what nature gave us. So when we come together, I think nature uh, uh, will help us uh, mysteriously. I will skip this, but my recommendation is also to my fellow researchers here, how Ethiopia was able to resolve a transboundary issues, you know, arising from a transboundary resource should be studied and sampled and make it available for the continent and generations uh, to come. Uh, with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Marlet, thank you so much for setting the floor on fire. Ethiopians are on fire for Africa. Ethiopians are on fire to unite, on fire to come and preserve Ethiopia as one. And this is, you know, one of the projects that are making it real. We're really tangible. It's near. And I really uh, appreciate your participation. It's like, well, my nature is to keep the best for last. Sorry for keeping you waiting. And I really, really uh, kept the best for last. We are taking this fire, we're taking our torch and running with it and fulfilling our call and uh, bridging the gap of, uh, of the differences. So 
I will go straight to the question so that we can finish. We are a little bit late. Uh, the I would uh, I didn't regroup uh, to whom goes the question, so I'll just just follow follow the chronological uh, order, and I will tell uh, to whom it will be addressed and from whom it is. So the next question would be uh, is from Awal. Uh, Awal says, given the overall flow, given the overall flow potential of the Apai River, why should we be limited only to producing electricity? Why not? Why not also irrigation? I think this is a rhetoric question. Ah, well, it's obvious there are going to be a lot of other projects after the GERD and including also irrigation. Thank you for your question. Um, uh, Maskeram asks, outside of desire on the part of Egypt to control Nile waters, are there any scientific concerns? If so, how can they be addressed to satisfy Egypt and Sudan? I think that question would be uh, would go to uh, Dr. Rousseau. I can repeat the question if you like. Yeah. So how how Ethiopia? Say it again, please. So, out, outside of desire on the part of Egypt to control Nile waters, are there any scientific concern? If so, how can the how can they be addressed to satisfy Egypt and Sudan? um well i i will just stick to the water resources and hydrology and water how much it takes to fill and so on um, as far as i can see as far as many scientists they see that there isn't any uh, impact to downstream countries where we are today to fill the dam uh, just to give you perspective um, an average ethiopia's contribution for overall nile uh, not not just the blue nile where the or or uh, the Kurabai, which where the dam is, um, that one is 49 per, uh, billion cubic meter, but total Ethiopia contributes 77 billion cubic uh, meters of the total Nile flow. Uh, of that, we use um, less than 10%, less than 10%, I repeat, 10% every year of our contribution. So there isn't really any impact when you look at it as a big picture Nile contribution of Ethiopia. If I come back to the Blue Nile, um, there isn't because the last three years has been great. Uh, in fact, uh, 2020 was one of the highest once in 100 year uh, uh, flow. Not at all. Um, this year, the year before, even the next year, we can see. And the other thing is that if we look at where the Aswan High Dam is today, um, it is the highest it has been in 30 years. In 30 years, three zero. That's a lot of water there. So even if Ethiopia could, I mean, they cannot feel it now because it depends on the construction. So as they construct, raise the middle block, they can only hold so much. So even if Ethiopia were to finish the whole project today and fill it, it's not going to impact them. So that that that's just the reality. Um, they have been like that since uh, late 1990s. Um, the the flow has been, I mean, they store quite a bit compared to where they were before. Uh, for Sudan, not at all, because Sudan typically has a very uh, small storage. Uh, if you add up all the dams in Sudan, mm, give or take maybe like 15 billion, 15 billion. Uh, so that's not, that's like less than one month's flow of August coming in Blue Nile. So they, they don't have a space at all. Uh, Ethiopia has also co uh, contributed and they use the, most of you have uh, probably saw the, they uh, they put a, a, what we call the bottom outlet. So they are sending water through the two turbine, the two bottom outlet, which are able to pass the entire Nile flow, annual flow, by the way. Uh, so there isn't really any um, any impact that you can see from scientific perspective. Uh, it, it is other issues that we can talk more uh, that are you know related to water sharing and that kind of stuff that that they are raising, but there's nothing that for for Egypt to worry right now, for Sudan to worry right now um, 
as far as filling the girdies. Thank you so much, Dr. Borosov. Uh, the next question is from uh, Kasahun. So uh, Kasahun says, COP27, COP27 is coming next November. There is a lot of activities observed in Egypt using the opportunity to sell that narrative. What will be Ethiopia, Ethiopian position and the level of engagement? Is there any plan from We Aspire? I guess that's that's for me too. So um, yeah, it's true. I think COP27 uh, is coming and there are many um, countries putting forward their proposal. I think the last one I saw from Egypt was, uh, I believe they have like four projects. And uh, you know, one of them was for some resilience. I'm, I cannot tell from the title, but others are um, a couple of projects that looks at the uh, electric light rail type of project. And then the other is, uh, I believe it's a desalination facility or something like that. I believe they were forwarding something, you know, 14, 15 billion dollar, some investment. Uh, it's good that they're looking at for desalination. Earlier you heard as well, because uh, I work for a company who actually was the first in the North America to make a desalination facility here. And I have seen uh, how cheap desalination has come. Uh, Professor Lick mentioned about the success in, in Israel, for example. They are one of the you know, uh, places to look up to as well. Um, it has come significantly cheaper. Uh, so that's good to see you know, Egypt is looking on that, expect, uh, on that aspect too, because uh, most of them is related to desalination facility. Cost is electric cost. So the treatment um, is not that much. Um, so most of the, once you build it, most of the costs come from electricity and then, uh, you know, Egypt has a lot of <laughs> uh, electricity in terms of, you know, the uh, solar and others as well. Uh, from Ethiopia, uh, I think uh, GERD-like, uh, we need to do more uh, uh, from a hydroelectric uh, perspective. There's a lot uh, that could be a narrative. I think the question is, um, that GERD already is a clean energy, uh, as well as providing tremendous amount of electricity that we, we already discussed in terms of the benefit. The green legacy is huge one as well. Um, and then also, how do you mitigate uh, Im um, impacts of flood and recurring drought? I think Ethiopia needs to invest because the narrative and, and the project put forward by Egypt is, is as I just mentioned, it was for project. Ethiopia should put forward or others as well. Uh, how do you put even more dams? I think if you put me in that place, I will say we need to put more dams because um, we have been impacted quite a bit in terms of this uh, climate. Ethiopia is a big country and also how climate impacts Ethiopia is different. Uh, the last three years, what we call we are in La Nina, you can see that halfway the west is a lot of rain, great for GERD, but if you go to the east, including Kenya and the south, it's drought for the last three years. There is no way uh, the Ethiopian, you know, the south, south uh, east is going to survive without any storage. So those are the things Ethiopia has to put in play as well. Uh, you know, the need for that. How do you tackle this? Uh, your your greenhouse gas emission decreasing, and then also cheap energies. Not only that, we have some alternative energy as well, wind, uh, thermal. Um, so from energy sector, I think there is a big uh, we can offer. Uh, you know, we are the second populous country in Africa. So if we are able to invest on this, it's a win-win for us and for the country for 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 the world as well. Thank you. Uh, the final question, last one. Uh, we go back to Ismail. Uh, he says, "Thank you very much, uh, Malet, for your presentation." And his question is uh, taking into account how the international mainstream media is being instrumentalized by the Western powers, relaying lots of unresearched and fake news. Don't you think that we need uh, Pan-Africanists to add to, to, the, to the 10 main strategies 
a strategy to create independent major African media outlets like radio, TV, with the aim to re relay, relaying our own narrative more appropriately and truthfully. truthfully. That will be a question for Mahdi. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do agree, uh, Ismail, with what you said. It's definitely important uh, to have our own media platform to tell our narratives. I mean, Ethiopia in the last two years, we have seen how we are bashed by the, in the so-called international media. Inter I mean, I always have a problem with the word international. In, who, I mean, which, who is international community? The West, does it represent the whole South? I mean, it, it doesn't, but anyway, uh, we do need that. And I, I do ask that question to myself, for example, like this great, um uh, uh billionaire billionaires in the in the continent like uh, the dangote like uh, the mo ibrahim foundation why they are not thinking they know i mean they are they, 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 they are aware about the problem but why they are not really having uh, that uh, platform or creating or investing. I even had a talk with some of Eastern African journalists in Uganda and Kenya, and they say it's something that the government do not want to invest. It's also something that the private uh, investors in the country do not want to invest. Well, my brother, my advice is that until that happens, let's come together. For example, I do have, I created this media platform you know it's a pan-african media platform and there are others so many let's keep on you know talking issues to look at things from the african perspective what happens in ethiopia affects what uh, in uganda or in kenya or in djibouti let's discuss them i mean uh, there is a change by the way we should also acknowledge there are so many pan-african discussions in twitter space happening in youtube on radio it's but eventually we would see uh, a change but until then we need to get uh, we need to use uh, the whatever opportunity uh, we have uh, even if it's small uh, and then uh, use it uh, but i think also as a, uh, as a plus or a bonus information the african union is also have that uh, program or i don't know project uh, i can call it to have this african media but of course we know if it's going to be uh, broadcasted uh, from the African Union? Does it really reflect what the people are saying? Uh, yeah, so let's have, let's, uh, let's use the opportunities that we have around us, whether it's a YouTube channel or whatever, until we get there, eventually we will make a change. But on top of that, I always say this when I have a discussion with my people on my platform that, in, I mean, okay, the media is not there, but let's focus on teaching our our children, our siblings, our, you know, the next generation, while we are so much invested to change people who are grown up, including ourselves, we forget people that are growing from that. I mean, we should really invest on the children, on education, and then uh, in the next 20 years, uh, two decades, three decades, the continent will just be fine. Let's do our responsibility. Let's start from the family. Uh, that's also my advice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, everybody, uh, the panelists who participated. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency, Henok uh, Shaul. Thank you very much, Professor Enrich, for your insights. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Teruso, uh, for your scientific approach, uh, anchoring us on how uh, Ethiopia is uh, driving by uh, the, driving this change, uh, this true inclusivity in the global, uh, in the global, in, in the international uh, realm. And thank you very much, uh, Mahle for setting us on fire. And I really encourage every one of us to come back and listen uh, for, uh, for these messages. I think I'll come back for Mahalit. Whenever I feel down, I come back for her fire. And uh, I, uh, I invite uh, our uh, uh, closing uh, speaker, uh, uh, if, I, oh. if, if you can allow me a few seconds, Herman, please, please. it's a sisterly advantage. So I just wanted to say whatever I say, it's, uh, you know, 
I am, okay, I'm a Pan-African, but I'm also the embodiment of all these Pan-African leaders that I look up to, that I listen to. And then my my fellow Ethiopian researchers, when I read Dr. Teruso Atefa's articles, and then when I read the books of Professor Haggai, so I'm that embodiment uh, of what I read and what I see. So I'm not just alone. Uh, so everybody has a, a contribution uh, towards it. So thank, I just wanted to make that remark. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes. Thank you for reminding us to be the bridge. We are all the bridge and we will fill the gaps of our narratives being snatched away and uh, like Ismail mentions the mentioned the mainstream media trying to uh, you know patch their narrative, their way of say of seeing us, their way of wanting to uh, give us the agendas that don't concern us, that our governments, neither our scientists uh, forged. And yeah, definitely looking forward for finally the the this image of, of Ethiopia being renewed and being understood and heard from the people who are now coming together and national dialogue. And I definitely ask and push back uh, for this space to be safe and respected as dignified people we are, and that uh, the Western interventions are not helping. They were not helping. It took 30 years of uh, aid narrative and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, dependency on, food, food aid, uh, that we are now saying no more. Uh, please stay watch. We are very active on social medias, on blogs, on Facebook, on Twitter. And uh, please stay watch of the new, new messages that I will be coming out. We are saying, say it, say no more. So please watch for hashtag say no more. Every one of us are coming together from all four corners of Africa to say now we are dignified people and you have to respect our space. We need our space to find each other again and go back to our basics, go back to sharing our histories, our stories, and go back to knowing each other, making this uh, imaginary colonial walls called frontiers fall down uh, we are building our economies and we are uh, encouraging trade, inter, inter Pan African nation trade. And all Africans are really are coming together to say no more. And we're saying no more again as Africans. Thank you so much. And I invite Ahun to make the final speech and close the meeting. Before, I think Doug Murray has a question. Uh, it came, I, uh, so it, but if he's not up, sorry, sorry. I, I closed, uh, if All you right. want, yes, please go ahead. If, if but... he's there, if not, you know, we, uh, it's, it's fine. Okay. Dagmar, are you there? Okay, maybe, yeah, please get out, sorry. <laughs> get out, please go ahead, sir. All right, thank you, Mahalet, and thank you, Armela. And uh, well, I see that uh, we've been here for two and a half hours. So thank you for all the participants who stayed here. And most importantly, thank you for all the panelists who have given us, I think, a very educational uh, and uh, instructive uh, uh, session. I think it was a very instructive session. Uh, Ambassador Henok, if you remember, he started by elaborating on the title of the event itself. So he went from what it means to Ethiopia, then he went on to Africa, then wider to, to the world. He reminded us that the Renaissance, the R in GERD, is actually a spiritual way of, for Ethiopians to reunite or unite for a purpose. And that when we have dedication, we can achieve and uh, that our social fabric is indeed stronger with this type of endeavor and the project. Uh, and it's true, uh, given the, the pressure that our nation was in the past two years, that we have uh, achieved that uh, the, the, the third feeling and the, the second turbine is a, is a big milestone and a great achievement indeed. He also reminded us that Africans, when we are determined and masters of our destiny, we can achieve a lot. And the, the GERD is 
a project of injustice or correcting injustice and unfairness and the revival of the spirit of Adawa and the many other actions and results that the African Union has done despite many critiques. Then we had another perspective from uh, Professor Elric, which is was more uh, historic for Tkefti, as he's a scholar uh, on Egypt and Ethiopian history. He went on a long analysis, historic analysis between Egypt and Ethiopia, going to the Bible, why and how the Nile is associated with Egypt since uh, ages, since the age, uh, since the time of Herodotus, and that in uh, the geography area we. So we sometimes forget that it's the longest river, and then that it has also 11 riparian countries on the African continent. He went along with the Aswan down, the small one, and he elaborated historically how the Arab revolution then, when led by Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, went and uh, delivered this, this the second project, which is the Aswan dam, building it in the wrong place and the wrong dam. So wrong dam at the wrong place is the uh, big Aswan dam. Egypt, he reminded us that Egypt repeatedly refers to the historical rights, ignoring Ethiopia's right and other 11 riparian country. He went on to Menelik, as a Menelik emperor, Menelik, Haile Selassie, and uh, that uh, many of us, many Ethiopians know that um, Ethiopians didn't know much on the Nile for centuries. And now that uh, the past few decades have been really uh, revealing. He agrees with Mr. Ambassador Henok that this is a really uh, an, in, uh, an endeavor that unites the country. It's a great enterprise that unites the country and that win-win solutions are indeed the right way to go. Uh, uh, that uh, we will have in um, in one generation 500 million people living in Ethiopia plus Egypt and Sudan, and that the water level will not increase. Therefore, we have to be innovative in terms of uh, acknowledging that we have shared uh, shared destiny and that equitable rights and equitable share of the uh, of the water resources should be the right way to go. Dr. Turuso, who is an expert in water resource engineer, gave us a very insightful and detailed um, explanation on how the GERD and the climate change interrelate. He, ad he appreciated Ambassador Henoch's reference to adaptation and mitigation, reminded us that we have heat waves in Europe, which is true. We all are experiencing it, the events in the US. Um, and that uh, the GERD fits really in terms of irrigation, uh, industrial expansion, and that we need to put more dams in Ethiopia to mitigate droughts and flood. And his conclusion also uh, touched upon the high complementarity between agriculture and in industry, uh, and a lot of detailed explanation on the climate change impact that are going to be worse. Now, Mahalet was a very energetic and uh, insightful as well. She reminded us the foreign policy um, of Ethiopia, relating it to Haile Selassie, uh, from Haile Selassie to Dr. Abi, how the GERD interrelates to the African Union, and that self-funding homegrown projects are really important and exemplary, and that they could possibly be replicated to other African countries. And last but not least, she reminded us that once and for all, we have to dismantle all colonial treaties, including the ones that are relating to the Nile. And she made a lot of uh, some recommendations for research. With this, I will conclude uh, by saying few of my own um, comments. I would like to congratulate all of us Ethiopians. The, the third feeling, as I said before, is a major achievement, especially considering the amazing, the, the unique pressure that this nation had in the past two years. So it's a, it's a sign that even under pressure with all the challenges, pressures, war, we can really complete projects in Ethiopia. So mind you, imagine if the, the, the day we'll go through this transition, what 
other projects that we can replicate, not just in the, in the energy area, but other fields as well. It's an amazing achievement. So I would like to thank all the participants again, the panelists, the Defend Ethiopia uh, steering group members who have actively participated in making this a successful one. And more importantly, Mahalit, because this is her brainchild. This was her project. She had the idea and she brought it to life. Thank you, Mahalit, and uh, congratulations for uh, the amazing work you are doing in this. We will have these videos posted on our website, which is as defendethiopia.com. If you want to contribute in terms of, uh, in, you know, uh, advocacy and uh, uh, defending or protecting Ethiopia's rights, whether it's the, related to the Nile, you can contact us through our website. The videos will be the video will be cut and posted on our website, so watch it, and we will amplify it and share it and make good use of this session. Again, thank you for all the participants, the panelists. Uh, back to you, Ermela. Thank you. I thought you were making the closing speech. It's an honor. Uh, I would like to remind everybody that at this present time, there are our brothers and sisters who are giving their lives to protect their country and the law and the interest of their families behind. So I would invite everybody to uh, keep uh, uh, reminding prayer for our brothers and sisters who are out there uh, defending uh, their nation and the interests of their people of Ethiopia. Um, we discuss a lot of times with uh, Gedaun and this is a subject that is really in our hearts and uh, very essential. GERD is also about bringing lasting peace at last in our nation. And I really am uh, in awe of being here. Uh, the opening synopsis of the ambassador really took the rest right in my heart. And yeah, we are all aligned. Uh, we stand on these words. Uh, and we choose also our words because everything that is being said about us, towards us, against us, as long as we push back with our own words, cannot count. They will not be fulfilled in our land. And we Ethiopians are in prayer for peace, for work, and for bringing lasting peace at last, for that our children's children will mark with the golden pen, pen everything that happened so that it's a lesson learned and that we will not repeat it again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Hagali. Thank you, Dr. Trusso. Thank you, my colleagues, everyone here. Yeah. And thank you, Hermela, to you too for wonderfully uh, handling this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.